<clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Shelly here and um, welcome. I'm just going to wait for a minute before I um, start getting into my discussion because I want to let a few people know that I'm actually live. Um, here we go. Just bear with me. Somebody's having a bad day here. I can hear sirens. All right. Okay, I think I think I have that done, and we will just okay. Here we go. Just have one more thing that I need to do and we'll get rolling here. Here we go. Good morning, good morning. All right. So I'm a little slow that it, today. I, I had a, uh, my daughter got married this weekend and um, it's been a little busy and I'm still, <laughs> I think I'm still in recovery mode here. Uh, but it was lovely, very, very hot. And um, yeah, so, uh, so that's been keeping me busy. And um, now it's time to get back into the swing of things and uh, get caught up on a few, a few things I'm working on. Yeah. Yes, Sue, thank you so much. Um, though it was actually Friday, uh, but uh, yeah, and it was quite warm, quite, quite warm, but uh, hey, no rain, no wind, and uh, it was, everything was lovely. So, um, okay, so, so let's just jump in here and uh, we'll start talking about some of the materials and things that I like to use, because I get a lot of questions about that sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> with uh, fall approaching and a lot of people are considering watercolor classes and things like that, I know that you, you know, when you sign up for a class, you get a, a materials list and it can be so confusing what, what, what it is you're supposed to bring. Will this be good enough? Will that be good enough? And that sort of thing. So, so hopefully this will, um, you know, help alleviate maybe some of your fears about whether or not uh, you have the right materials to do what you need. Um, first off, um, I'm going to see if I can get my paint wet. I had a pipette in my hand. Here we go. This is a pipette. These are tube watercolors. Uh, they are um, mainly da Vinci, but any tube watercolors, you can fill up a palette like this. This is a travel palette. It, it folds closed, but you can't fold it when it's wet, of course. Um, but these, these paints are all rock hard. So what I need to do 
is I need to soften them up. So I'm taking my water container and I am softening up all this paint so that it will get creamy again because I want it similar to the way it comes out of the tube. Um, so I'm just going to um, talk about this type of um, getting your materials together and you know what materials you should have and stuff like that but um, um, I'll be watching the chat here and uh, you can ask me I mean every week I present something but um, I don't really give like and there's probably things you want to learn or want to know about that you maybe don't get a chance to uh, ask about so um, that's what I thought I would do today and I have soaking wet hair right now, so I am not going to go on camera, but um, <clears throat> here we go. Okay, so everything's pretty wet, and you can see I put quite a bit in there. <clears throat> and that's going to take a while before that actually softens that up. Like, basically, it's water sitting on top of hard paint at the moment. But uh, when it sits long enough, it's like it's like soaking a pot that's got dried sauce in it or something. You know, it just takes a little while to, to sort of soften things up. Um, but I'm going to just set that aside for a minute. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about paper. So paper's really confusing sometimes. There's hot press, cold press, rough. <clears throat> Pardon me. <coughs> All right, but then you have um, uh, most of your watercolor paper will be um, cotton, okay, or at least a cotton blend, okay. So a lot of the a lot of the papers that you get that are inexpensive have wood pulp in them. Um, they they don't have um, the same archival qualities that um, hundred percent cotton paper will have. And um, so what that means is, is that um, cotton, as you know, is very absorbent. So this paper will be very, very soft and absorbent. But if it has a lot of, um, uh, like if it's only partially cotton, then it is going to be probably less absorbent. So you're going to have um, paint that's going to sit on top a little bit more, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so you've got the 100% rag content and it's cotton and that sort of thing. Uh, then you've got your um, student grade. Now, so what's the difference, right? Well, wood pulp, as you know, like if you've ever looked at an old newspaper, um, they turn brown, right? So, so there goes the archival qualities if you have um, wood pulp, because there's lots of things in, in wood like um, tannins and, and sap and all that stuff, right? So when you get your wood pulp, it's bleached and everything else. And it looks nice and white, uh, but over time it will brown. <clears throat> Cotton won't, but it's, and it's way, way more absorbent. Now, how they manufacture the uh, paper can make a big difference in how absorbent it can be too, because sometimes they use a press that's cold and uh, hence the name cold press. And what that gives you is it's, it's got a little bit of a pad to it. Maybe this one will show it a little bit more. Okay, so it's got a little bit of tooth to it. It's got like all this, these little uh, dimples and things. I'm getting a little closer on this. This is a piece of Arches 140 pound cold press paper, which is the one I use most of the time. That's kind of my go-to. Um, let me zoom in. All right, so maybe you can see, let it focus here for a second. Maybe you can see some of the texture in here. Um, and so it's got a um, little bit of tooth to the paper. This is another brand. It doesn't have as much tooth to it. You can tell that it's a lot smoother. It's got a little bit of texture, but not that much. This is a different brand. This one is a Canson. Uh, this one is a Fabriano, which has, again, a little bit of a different texture, but it's, it is 100% um, cotton paper. And um, 
<clears throat> so you're going to get the different textures to the paper depending on that. Hi Colleen. Um, so uh, you've got you've got the different uh, types of cold press. Now what the difference is here is that with a hot press paper that when they when they take the, the cotton pulp and they press it together in in the press if that press is hot it's just like taking an iron to it and it's going to smooth it out it's going to smooth out all the wrinkles and a lot of the texture so your surface is going to be a lot smoother but you also have to consider that the um, that the fibers are being compressed by that heat and so they're going to be much more packed together and it's not going to be as absorbent all right so you've got that then you've got another um, another type which I don't have on hand but it is called rough and it has more texture um, and it will also um, it'll be very absorbent because the fibers are kind of loose so it's it, when it, the rough paper doesn't isn't as compacted as say a hot press would be and yes you can paint on both sides Sue absolutely um, so without destroying your hard work. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, you can paint on both sides of the paper. Uh, the one thing I will advise about painting on two sides of the tape paper is that sometimes um, a, the darker tones, like if you go as dark as you know some of these things here, for example, if that's on the other side, sometimes that will come through. Like I don't mean it'll come through the, the paper. I just mean you can see it through it. Um, and uh, so, so like even here, there's you can you can see that there's something on the back of this. You can see my hand. You can see my finger through it. So if you have stuff um, painted on the back, for example, um, it can actually translate through your paper. Um, personally, if if I'm doing sketches and uh, practice work, I do I definitely use both sides of the paper. It's certainly more economical. Um, if if I'm doing a painting that is going to be in a show or something like that, I will only paint on one side. Um, I don't, I don't do painting. I, like I don't sell paintings that have paintings on the back, kind of thing. Um, if I did, uh, what I could do is perhaps paint over the other painting on the back, like like this sort of thing. I would paint um, maybe a coat of gesso, or two coats of gesso. I would hide that so that it would look a lot better for the um, customer. Um, but, but that would be extremely rare for me. I would usually only paint one side. But definitely for practice work, um, sure, go ahead, use both sides. Uh, nothing, nothing wrong with that one bit. Um, okay, so then there is the matter of this, what is this 90 pound, 140 pound, 300 pound, what is all that? Well, it's pretty simple because um, what it is, it just tells you the weight of a ream. A ream of paper is 500 sheets. So if 500 sheets weighs 300 pounds, it's thicker paper than a ream or 500 sheets that weighs only 90 pounds, right? So it tells you the thickness of your paper. Um, basically how much how much pulp they've used to create the paper with. Um, some people will use 300 pounds so that they don't have to stretch. Um, some people I, some people have a real aversion to uh, stretching the paper because it's an extra step. But um, you have to consider that 300 pound paper is also far more absorbent because of thickness, because it has a lot more fibers in it, much more absorbent. It's like thick paper towel versus thin, right? So uh, you're going to, it, you're, it's going to behave differently when you're painting. And um, it also will take longer to dry and use more paint. So those are things to consider. Now there is one other thing, and I don't have one because um, honestly I don't use them because I don't really like them that much, and that but they're extremely popular. Okay, now I just personally don't use them, and that is a watercolor block. Now a watercolor block is basically a um, it's like a pad of paper only instead of the glue being at the top, it's around 
all four sides with just a little gap near the top. And um, the gap at the top is just so you can get a, um, a palette knife or something in there and, and run it all around and release the top layer. So basically what you do with a block is you, you paint, paint the, um, do the painting, you finish it, you don't take it off of the block until the painting's done. I have seen, <laughs> I have had some students who take every piece of paper off and stretch it. They take it off a block and then they stretch it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that, that's so expensive to buy that convenience of having it on this block and then they're taking it off and stretching it anyway. So they could have bought just uh, loose paper. Um, but anyway, that's what the blocks are about. Uh, the reason that I don't use them is that I actually find that the paper in the blocks, like the arches blocks, is actually got a different texture than the sheets, which is what I like to buy. So I usually buy the, the 22 by 30 inch sheets. It's pretty large. Um, and then I cut it to the size that I want. So, um, so I cut it to the size that I want and, uh, you know, sometimes I have little pieces left over like this. You can see that it has a watermark. The watermark, um, obviously it's advertising for the company and, and that sort of thing. And that's all fine. Um, except I don't personally like it in my painting. You know, you can take this watermark and um, sort of burnish it down. You know, you could take your nail and, and sort of press down on it and, or palette knife or something like that and just see if you can flatten down that. Um, so I know some people that do that. I, I don't take the time to do that really, but I, I usually will try to ma make sure that this part is taped um, or I incorporate it into my design so that it's, it's not a distraction to the actual artwork. Um, you know, some people say, well, yeah, you should advertise that you're using really expensive paper. Well, yeah, but I'm at, it's like people who wear Nike shirts. It's great that you like the shoes and they're good quality and everything, but you don't have to wear it on your shirt. So I kind of feel the same way about about the, the logo. It is um, it is great paper and it's nice. It's okay that it's there. I just don't like it. Uh, I wish it was just a lot smaller, a lot more discreet. Anyway, um... So uh, that is uh, the variety of different papers. Now, I, I can't really talk about these papers without actually um, sort of showing you the differences because um, if I don't paint something on here, then it's just talk, right? So if I were to take, um, and I will talk about brushes in a few minutes, but if I were to take my uh, brush here, and pick up some paint. Let's pick up, um, a red will show up well, so I'll, I'll pick a red. And I'll just go into my, I can zoom out a little bit here. Okay, so I'm gonna take my red color, bring it into my mixing area. I'm gonna fill up my brush here and and I will paint, you know, I'll paint, just paint a squiggle. Now I'm going to do the same thing on here and the same thing on here. Let's do it at the bottom. All right, so they all look pretty, this pretty much the same, um, but where the big difference is going to be is when things get um, really wet uh, and when you're trying to work into wet or buy time and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to show you something else in a minute, but um, okay, so this one, I hope I have this right because these are scraps of paper. I think this might be an arches as well. These might, these two might be the same. Um, should have marked them, but anyway, uh, I'm going to put some something really wet on here. I'm going to really get it wet. So like really fill it up. And what you'll find is that even though these are all 140 pound, they will, um, they'll behave differently. And uh, so we'll just give that a minute to uh, do a bit of drying. I forgot to get my paper towels. Maybe I can grab one. 
and then left here. All right, so um, now if I come into this and I can sort of mix that in and you can see that's kind of moving around and we'll try this one. That one is actually, this. these are different papers because you can see that this one is getting a little bit of a watermark because the paint on here um, is more sitting on top and you can see when I paint through you can see that little ring there, you can see that. But the real, the real thing is, is especially washes, big washes of color. Um, let me try another color for the wash. Let's try cobalt. All right, so if I take my arches and I do a wash like this, just rinsing my brush and, and brushing it down, you know, I can see that paint's going to just move around and it will... You can see it's still moving on the paper. Let's try the same on this one. Let's get a little more paint here. Okay, nice wet paint. And then we'll continue down with, oops, I hit my red. We'll continue down with this. Um, and watch that flow. Um, Without using an entire piece of paper, I'm not going to be able to show how um, how different these are, I don't think, but okay, this one's this one's pretty I find that the Fabriano is pretty similar to um, arches. The one thing I have found about the Fabriano is that it doesn't take scrubbing as well. So it's it's very nice, behaves very similarly, but it doesn't, um, like you can see the, the difference in the texture here. All right, you can see that they're reacting a little bit at a little bit different but the the real test is putting it aside and waiting because the one thing about watercolor let me move this out this is too far away the one thing about watercolor is that um, it continues to change as it dries um, yeah okay Colleen uh, definitely cotton 100% cotton rag is is what I'm looking for um, Okay, so acid-free archival paper process to be white without bleach or lighting, lightning. Um, the, uh, how is it processed to be white without bleach or whitening? Um, it is, it is, it is, I believe they use a very uh, mild bleach in it, um, but it um, once it is once once the um, bleaching is rinsed off the pulp and everything, then it's it's gone. So then they make the paper. As long as you're not introducing things like wood fiber and things like that, wood pulp, um, which has all the the sticky tannins and and things like that that are going to make it go brown. Um, that's that's what's going to um, um, kind of ruin the effect of your paper, but more more than anything, I find wood pulp paper is just um, it, it doesn't have the absorbency. Uh, that's what bothers me most about the inexpensive papers, the student quality papers. Okay, so now why is paper so darn important? I can tell you that um, you will probably watch your instructor teach watercolor. They will be able to do magic on their paper and if you have a student quality paper and they have a, an, an artist quality paper you are not going to be able to reproduce what that teacher is showing you um, and I have seen it time and time again well I just bought this paper or I got this paper from my from my cousin because she gave up painting or whatever the case may be and what they don't understand is that um, they have now given 
themselves um, a handicap. <laughs> like where it's making it more difficult for themselves because the um, the paper isn't going to behave the way that the instructor just showed them how. So what I would suggest is get the best paper you can afford. Um, look for 100% cotton. Um, and whatever paper you like, try different papers by all means, try different papers. But if you want to really sort of hone your watercolor skills, I would say keep with one paper and uh, keep practicing it. Have you ever gotten into somebody else's car and, it, and the brakes act different and, and you know, you can't find all the buttons and, and, you know, the steering feels sluggish or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, it feels different, right? So you you don't really feel comfortable driving that car. Well, it's the same thing with uh, watercolor. So take a paper, whatever paper you happen to choose, um, pick it and work with it for a long time until you know that paper inside out. You, you get to learn how it behaves. Um, I might say the same thing about brushes. Um, use some brushes for a while until you kind of become friends with them and learn their all their idiosyncrasies, right? So let's go on to, I'm going to set my paints aside here. We'll, we'll let those keep softening up here for a few minutes and I'm going to talk a little bit about brushes. <clears throat> so you hear all the time, all oh, the best brushes for watercolor are uh, sable brushes. <clears throat> but there's so many great um, substitutes on the market now, synthetic sables. Um, by the way, sables actually a, a weasel, but it's um, but they don't they don't do that anymore. They, you can't you can't just buy pure sable brushes anymore um, because of, it's not humane. <clears throat> but you can get um, mixes of hair with um, you know by other means, right? They have other hair and uh, they can be mixed with uh, synthetic. So some of the brushes that I have are, <clears throat> I have this set of brushes, which are a really nice um, squirrel hair brush, synthetic blend actually, and um, they have uh, great points to them. So if I get this wet, and uh, you can see it has like a, a needle point. It's so flexible. And yet I can press this and spread it right out. Um, but it holds a ton of paint and water. So, you know, you, the test here is just take your bristles and squeeze and see how much comes out. You'll know how much your brush is holding. If I do the same thing with, um, let's see if I, here's a synth, this is a, no, it's not a pure synthetic. Um, <clears throat> well, it's, uh, this one's not as big, but it's it's a synthetic brush. And if I take this brush and I squeeze out, and I'm going to get like three drops, two or three drops. But let me get one that's about the same size. Let's get... Okay, so these two brushes, they look very similar in size, but they're going to behave very differently. Right? They look, they're, they're both round brushes. They look very much the same. Uh, but if I put my synthetic brush in, squeeze it out, I get one, two, three, four, four drops. That's it. Okay, so let's try this one. Now you're looking straight down, so you're not really seeing how many drops, but you can probably see it hit the water. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So this one's holding more, even though it's the same, same size brush, right? So I squeeze them equally. And, um, the reason that your synthetic or your natural hair brushes hold more, the synthetic hairs are poker straight. Um, they don't have that little bit of, um, a little, little bit of a wave in, in the brush where they, they can hold little pockets of, um, water or paint right so so that's and this one also but these it's not i'm not saying this one's better it holds more water which is very very helpful uh, these can be very useful as well 
because like they have a great spring to them, right? Whereas this brush, when it's wet, this one might spring back because it's a mix, but this one's not going to spring back quite as much. See, it's going to have, it's going to keep a bend, whereas this one is going to stay straight. Um, the one thing about painting with watercolor brushes, especially these natural hair brushes, I see people try to use them like an acrylic brush. So they press down on them and they're pulling. And, and what you're doing is you're pushing the paint into the paper as you're pulling. And um, you're not really making the best use of, of the brush. With watercolor, remember I talked about watercolor uh, or talked about the paper earlier, but if you if you're too aggressive on this paper, you can damage the paper. So let's be as gentle as possible. And so taking taking a brush and just, all I need to do is touch it and pull and I get the paint off. But that wouldn't be the case if this were acrylic. Like acrylic is a thicker uh, viscosity and it, it won't behave the same. But I can get some, uh, all I have to do is just scare, scarcely touch the surface and I get paint on my paper. Um, Now this brush is really good. It holds a lot. Um, doesn't have quite, it has a great point. Um, I've, I've used it quite a lot for, for washes and things, but these smaller sizes are even more pointy. So the reason I like this kind of a brush is that I can go from thick like this, right, really, if I lay the brush down, it can go from really thick to right up on the tiptoe and I can do the a fine line like that. Like so I can do the I can use it to I'm putting my hand in paint um, to get a really fine line like this or a very thick line. So I have lots of uh, it's flexible, right? I can get lots of that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the um, the strokes you make with these brushes because these are all nice and smooth on the edge but one of the things mark making in watercolor is one thing that is um, hard hard for a lot of uh, beginners to um, adopt right so when you paint something and let's say you let's say you've got a line here on your painting and what a beginner will do is they will you know, they'll do a perfect line like this, right? And they'll make it perfect on both sides. But really, with watercolor, one of the most beautiful things, I think, is allowing edges to become a little bit rough. So having it skip like this, having this edge imperfect, um, that sometimes can be one of the most endearing, uh, beautiful aspects of watercolor. So um, I know I'm a bit of a controlled freak myself and I, you know, I do, I do really, really precise work. People say it's very precise, but I also try to incorporate mixes like this or, um, mixture of different mark making. So, uh, let's see down here. If, if my brush sort of skims across the paper, I get these, these great marks here and that can be great to use in your painting. Um, I can also take this wet paint and mix other colors into it. Now that's going to go real dirty because it's like kind of an orangey red, but um, those two colors will mix together if I do them wet into wet. Um, if you are an acrylic painter, sometimes these concepts can be a little bit challenging to um, take in, but what I would suggest is just take some scraps of paper and just do some playing. So maybe try um, mixing, like if I were to do leaves, if I were to paint a leaf and I wanted to have them transition from one color to another. So we'll go pink and blue. I know pink and blue is not a normal leaf color, but um, you know, just see what the paint will do and just take a scrap of paper and play with it. Um, the only thing that's going to happen is you are going to get better at manipulating your brush 
better at controlling your paper um, or controlling your um, paint and that sort of thing. So only good things can come from practicing these little concepts. You can actually um, incorporate uh, some simple designs into some of your practice. And I've seen people do this with cards and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so um, uh, let's do, let's do yellow, right? So we'll do some yellow here. And one leaf at one petal at a time, I could do a flower. And bring that together. I should have done it the other way around. Um, but I get a lot of questions, especially about brushes and, uh, and paper. Paints, people tend to, um, yeah, we, we, color theory can be another whole ball game, but um, maybe we can talk about color another day. So that could be a whole discussion all in itself. And uh, so you notice what I'm doing is I'm putting one leaf, one petal down at a time, and then I am putting the other color in the middle. But I'm not stirring them together because what happens if I stir them together is I'm going to end up with green. And I don't want them to mix completely. Now we know that if we, if I mixed blue and yellow, I would get green. But I want a flower with blue petals and yellow in the middle. <clears throat> so I start the outside and I take my yellow and put that on the inside. And they can kiss, the, the two colors can kiss and touch each other. I'm just trying not to blend them all together. Now if I wanted to take something dark and stick it in the middle there, let's say a Payne's Gray or something, I could put that in and that would all blend into what's there. Right, so I could have kind of a, a pretty center. So this is the sort of thing you can just do to practice. Make bookmarks or, you know, you're probably gonna have scraps of paper at some point in your watercolor painting. Um, yeah, so so that's that's a great way to practice. Practice uh, mark making. Um, like if I were to do an, another leaf, um, practice um, <clears throat> getting one edge smooth and one edge rough. And um, let's go green on the other side. <clears throat> There goes my voice again. All right, so that edge has got a little roughness to it. That's what I was trying to do. So use kind of the side of my brush to get that mark. If you're always using the point of your brush, all your lines are going to be perfectly straight. But if you use the side of your brush, you'll get these wonderful broken edges because the paintbrush is actually going to skip over the texture of the paper and give those wonderful... Um, edges. I know um, <clears throat> it's, you know, you, you do your drawing and try to stay so true to your line drawing that, um, you know, your, your painting ends up tight. So I would suggest doing a minimal uh, drawing on your paper so that you don't get super tight with your strokes. Yeah, so try different color combinations. Uh, see what you like. Try dropping wet into wet. Try painting on a wet surface. So if I were to take some water here and paint it on here, sorry, my water's not that clean. Um, paint it on there. And if I tried to paint onto that wet surface, well, I guess you can guess what's happened. If I try, try to do that leaf now, um, it's not gonna be much of a leaf because it's just gonna melt. <laughs> so. <clears throat> but sometimes this is what you want. Maybe you've got leaves in the background and you want them out of focus or you want them to look kind of out of focus. So learn all the techniques. Don't just stick with one. Um, I use a variety within my painting so that I have uh, <clears throat> so that I have um, 
different ideas of, of depth perception, focus, um, value, uh, all that kind of stuff. So just take some scraps of paper and play with the intention of trying to create a particular type of an edge, you know, a soft edge like this, where it's sort of melting into a wet background, a crisp edge like we have up here with two colors melting together, a rough edge, something on dry with your brush kind of on the side so that you get that sort of broken edge, um, you know, mixing colors into colors, um, that sort of thing. So all of these things are just great things to practice and um, play with in your watercolors. Um, <clears throat> now I will talk a little bit about the actual paints themselves. Okay, so you can see I've wet these, uh, they're these are artist quality paints and what the difference is between artist quality and student quality is fillers. Student quality is basically called student quality because students usually don't have a lot of money and so they make it inexpensive. It doesn't mean that it's good to learn on <laughs> and I think that that's an important note to make. And why I said earlier that you want to have, use the best quality you can, you know, the best paper. By the way, paper, I think, is the most important ingredient in above, above paint, above the right brushes and everything else. Um, one of my other, just before I move on, and I just spotted one of my other brushes that I use quite a lot, and this is a fa little fan brush. And I use this for a variety of things. So I may use this for, say, grasses. I may use this for some grasses in my painting and it gives, you know, this great little flick flick um, to give me some grasses. I also use it for um, spattering, right? So it's, it's great for spattering. What I do is I just pick up some paint in my brush and I use another brush or a palette knife or something and I will, let's do it down here, and I will t just gently tap it. I'll hold it fairly close to the paper and tap it gently and I, I can get this great spatter. All right, so I, fi that's, I find this isn't as messy as using a toothbrush. So I like a little, and this is like cheap, cheap, this brush. I don't even remember where I got it. It's got a pink handle, <laughs> but any any little synthetic fan brush like that is can be very useful in your watercolor kit. Um, now the paints, yes, I was talking about the difference between uh, artist quality and student quality is filler. So paint contains uh, pigment, of course, uh, pigment. This the same pigment that's used in oils. Or acrylic or anything else it's pigment that's what the color is uh, that's what gives you the hue now in watercolor though what they add is this product which is gum arabic okay so gum arabic is kind of a clear amber type of liquid which you can see well i guess i can't really turn it towards the camera the, the liquid just flows down but you can see the liquid and um, this is what makes it creamy like this and so when you have student quality, you have um, paint, you have gum arabic, but you've got a lot of fillers in there too. So you've got um, things to make it inexpensive because pigment's expensive. Gum arabic can be ex expensive. So, um, so they put other fillers in there to make it stretch further, right? And um, so... What, it, what the result is when you're painting is sometimes you can get um, a really bright, vibrant, uh, rich color from artist quality because there's so much pigment, pure pigment in it. Whereas uh, with uh, student quality, because you have fillers, you may end up with color that's a little bit more... Um, um, isn't isn't as vibrant right so it's just not going to have the same sort of vibrancy and uh, I found personally that when I was using student quality I ended up using more paint so I'm not really sure where the savings was but um, 
The other thing I find that is because of a lot of the fillers that they use with um, student quality, very often, um, like I've seen these sets uh, where you have like a whole a whole assortment of uh, student quality, like you can buy a whole kit for fifty dollars kind of thing, and uh, uh, they almost always have cadmium this or cadmium that or cad 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 um, or chromium or any of those other pigments that are um, very opaque. And the one thing about watercolor is. Uh, transparency and allowing the white of this paper and by the way I use bright white paper they have a natural white as well which is just not quite as uh, brilliant it's a little bit warmer so the bright white's kind of cool white and then natural white is kind of warm white but um, but the white of the paper coming through that's your light source in your painting and you if you're covering that up with cadmiums uh, then you you are losing the light coming through your painting and your painting won't have that watercolory glow that you might be looking for, right? So I have a list, or not a list, but I have a chart which I created with uh, the paints that I have. All right, so I keep this in a little bag and what I do here, okay, so the, this has, you see every, every card has a big black line down it. And this is just a big black magic marker, permanent waterproof, obviously. And what I did was I took my pigments, all the ones that I have, and I painted a you know good strong dose of this color across here. Now, look at here. You can see that this blue, which on the back it says is cobalt blue deep. Okay, so this blue is a little bit more opaque because you can see the color on top of black. This one, you don't see much color on top at all. So this one's more transparent. This one's more opaque. Now let's go to something that uh, is a cadmium. because I have several cadmiums in here. Um, okay, so this orange, you can definitely see it on top of the black. So I know that that's an opaque color. This one is not opaque at all. This one, what is this one? This one is brown matter, okay? So this one is not um, sitting on top and showing, uh, covering up the black line so much. Uh, this one, what's this one? Scarlet Pyrrole. Okay, so that's a really old one. That's an M. Graham I've had for some time. And, uh, Look at some of these, all right? You can really see the difference between um, which ones are opaque. Look how transparent that one is. Look how opaque this one is. This one's really covering up the paper. This one isn't. You can see a lot of the paper sort of shining through the screen. And you can really tell with that black line. Now you're probably looking at this and going, well, what, what's all this business about? So this, this is lifting, okay? So when you, when you paint this on, and some of this has been here for a good long time, and I take a brush and I just take it and I scrub, scrub a spot, and then I take paper towel and I pull off as much as I can. And you can see that some of these colors lifted pretty well, but look at this one left a stain. This one's probably got, I bet that's Viridian. It is. Viridian, Viridian is one of those greens that really, really stains. Um, this one lifted much better, but it's very opaque. So even if, like, I had a lot of paint tubes that were given to me. Um, oh, yes, I will. I'll do that, Patricia. Yes, I will. Um, but the... Um, Yeah, it's very opaque. This is a chromium. So any paints that say chromium or cadmium, they're usually opaque. And um, so if sometimes, and sometimes there will be instances where you want to actually lift color, and uh, you, it's good to know before you put the paint down whether it's going to lift. Like this one, I couldn't get this one off. This one was quite, um, 
quite there for good. <laughs> I couldn't get much of that off at all. So um, it's good to have a record of all your paints. And you notice I've, I've put the pigment numbers here, uh, pigment numbers. If it has more pigments in the mix itself, um, it's going to be less, um, it might be, it might not be as good for mixing color because uh, when you have uh, um, two pigments already, you've already got a mix and then you mix it to something else and you're not always going to be able to predict as well what the, um, what the result will be. So if you can look for as few pigments as possible. Also, if your instructor, like if you're signing up for classes this fall and your instructor gives you a list of colors and um, you think you might have something close to it, there's a pretty good chance you do have something close to it. So what I would suggest is take your paint tube, check out the pigment that's on it, check out the one you think is similar and compare the pigments. They may be the same pigment. Um, so anyway, but I have a good list of uh, my colors here that I can um, use that I, it's, I find it very helpful as well. So if I zoom out here and you're looking at my palette, looking at my palette, it, can you tell the difference between a lot of these colors? It's really hard. But if I have this, I can see what it'll look like painted on my paper, right? So these, this is really, really quite invaluable to have. <clears throat> yeah, so sometimes, um, this is for you, Patricia. Um, sometimes you want to have a really nice straight line with your um, watercolors. And what I do, this is a stylus. It's a, it's a little tool. It's got a tiny ball on either end. It's metal, but it has a little tiny ball on either end so it doesn't scratch your paper. And um, I will take a, a brush something long and thin if I want to make a long thin line so I'll take a long thin brush and I'll pick up a color let's pick up purple okay so pick up some purple on my brush and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hold these side by side I'm gonna line up the tips so that they're the same all right so I've got this tip and this tip um, yeah, I misplaced my ruler, but I will use my remote control as a nice straight edge because it has a nice straight edge here. And uh, I just hold the stylus against the ruler and I can make my straight line. Perfect, right? Absolutely perfect. And this keeps the pressure um, so that, you know, because if you're pressing, if I'm hold, hand holding it, sometimes I can't keep the pressure of my um, brush even. <clears throat> yes, it's a black magic marker. In fact, I just went to the dollar store and I got one. It's called a jumbo marker. And um, it's a great big fat marker. Just make sure it's waterproof though, because if you start painting your paint over top <clears throat> and uh, the paint, the marker starts running, well, that's not going to do you any good. So it has to be waterproof, whatever you put down. Um, now, there, you'll probably hear about some paints that are fugitive, okay? So fugitive paints and whether or not they will last in, in exposure to UV rays, right? So what you can do for, uh, to test whether or not the colors you have, because I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in you know, a lot of what you have is probably fine. You just don't know it. And uh, so if I were to take a color and um, paint in, let's paint in uh, this blue, for example, and I could, I could do this with all my paints if I want to. And I, if I paint <clears throat> a block like this, Right? And I could, I could paint a whole strip of, of different uh, colors, right? All the colors I want to test. I would let that dry and um, make sure that it's, you know, even, that I don't have it darker on one side and lighter on another, just all even like this. Let that dry and then I would cover half of it and place it somewhere where it's going to get a lot of light. 
Um, for example, the back window of your car will definitely get a lot of light. It'll get hot. It'll get a lot of um, sort of sun most of the day, um, unless you're parked under a tree all the time. But uh, yeah, it'll it'll get a lot of sun. Um, and, and I would leave that for like three months or something. Um, check it every once in a while, you know, just cover it up with something like that. So, so you're basically blocking the light from one half of that sample. And then you'll really see side by side what the difference is and which ones are going to fade with light or fade with time and which ones won't. Uh, so you can do, conduct your own little test that way um, to do that. Um, keep your palette limited. Like, I know I have a ton of colors, uh, you know, and a lot of, a lot of cases are like, people have given them to me or I just got carried away at the art store and I saw something I really liked and I, I have like three palettes like this with all the different colors that I have and I have all these colors just that I've acquired and really I could just I should I could just give away a whole bunch of them because um, the uh, um, the essentials or the the workhorses of your um, palette are going to be your primaries now for each of my primaries I have a cool and a warm a cool and a warm cool and a warm so um, I make sure that I have a cool and a warm. Now, that doesn't mean, like, they're both red, right? Reds are warm colors. But it means one, relatively speaking, one is cooler. Relatively speaking, one is warmer, or whatever the case may be, right? So I have a warm and a cool of each primary. Then I will have a couple of neutrals, like, like burnt sienna, like raw sienna. Like, those are two that are kind of go-to for me. Um, and okay, so one of each primary, one of a couple of neutrals and a couple of darks. So I usually will have something like a Payne's gray. Um, what's this one? This one's a, oh, an, a neutral tint, uh, is another nice dark that you can use. Um, these two neutral tint and Payne's gray almost, um, I mean, so it, it can almost take on the appearance of black, but it's not black. So it's it's a little bit more bluish than, than black watercolor. I wouldn't actually suggest black watercolor because it's very, um, it's, a, it's a lifeless color. Um, you know, go either cool or warm with your darks. So I've got, a, this is the neutral tint, which is dark, but it's more, it has almost a purple tint to it. This Payne's Gray has kind of a bluish green tint to it. So um, I can get some variations in my dark. Sometimes it's a little easier to get the, the darker values in your watercolors when you have a couple like this. So, you know, I usually will use one or the other there um, in my painting, depends on what I'm doing. And uh, you know what? A lot of these other paints that I have on here. Uh, they're just nice ones to have once in a while. Like I love this for beach. Like if I were doing a tropical beach, this is a great one to have. Um, you know, sap green I use sometimes, but mixed greens can be very interesting. A couple of purples. You know, I filled up my palette basically um, with other things that I thought I might use. Then my my other palettes, the ones that I have, are the things that I seldom use. Uh, but I found that I needed to put them into another palette because um, I have no space left here if I ever wanted to use them. So I thought if they're ever going to get used, at least having another palette is not the way to do it. Um, okay, so um, we covered brushes, paint, um, uh, the lines, uh, mixing colors. Oh, I didn't talk too much about mixing colors, but I'm, I meant like getting the colors blended, letting them blend themselves. Um, letting colors blend themselves, that's, that's a hard concept for somebody who's new to watercolor. Um, because the, in, if you were working in oils or acrylics, you would have to actually use your brush to mix those colors. But in watercolor, it does that for you automatically. So if I wanted to make a, uh, 
Let's do a an orange leaf here. So I'll start with a, a nice red here on one side, maybe like this. And then I would pick up, uh, let's do some quinacridone gold. And, and I can touch that in there and it's mixing itself. I don't have to do a thing. It's just doing it automatically. Um, and like I said, I'm hardly touching the paper. I don't have to manipulate anything. I had a couple of little granules in there because I didn't mix up my paint very well. But um, but the, the pink and that gold have mixed together all by themselves perfectly, much better than your brush could ever do. So um, try to allow your watercolors to do their own mixing. Don't try to, don't force it. Uh, I guess that's probably my best advice is don't force watercolor. Let it let it just happen the way it happens. Um, you know, if you get little imperfect edges, all the better. You know, I think I think those those rougher edges can be can be quite beautiful. Says the woman who does really detailed work, but um, but yes, I I love doing both kinds. Uh, people just know me more for the the tight. Um, precise watercolors that I do uh, but this I, I would strongly recommend just playing with some different papers different brushes and paint and just do some exercises just say you know I know paper is expensive and everything else but um, learning is more valuable than the paper is so uh, take the time to learn on some paper um, yeah yes a black magic marker um yeah so i think i'm going to wrap it up for today i don't think that there's um well there is one thing i could still show and that is uh, maybe using a tool like this like a palette knife and i can actually scrape into paper and leave lines like this if the paper's wet it'll fill back in but if the paper's starting to dry i'll be able to scrape white lines into it which is great for trees which is another demo I showed a few weeks ago if you want to look that one up but sometimes you want to get some some marks in your paper and uh, you can create some effects doing that too uh, so in terms of tools I've got uh, synthetic brushes um, I think it's really good to have one like this it's got a really long point uh, long and skinny um, if you're trying to do detail, I, I don't, I don't like these brushes that have, only, you know, only like a quarter inch of brushes on, or bristles on them, because they don't hold enough water to keep going, right? So if I take a brush like this and fill it up, right, a brush like this, I could go and go and go and go and go, right? Because it holds so much, it's so long, like. You know, it's still going, still holding paint, starting to run out now. So it, that went a long way, but I wouldn't have been able to do that with a little short brush. So something long and thin, like a, a script liner, or um, or this is a this is a Chinese brush, um, you know, that has a really nice tip. Something like that's really handy to have. The um, that fan brush I talked about is uh, very helpful to have, I find. Uh, now, these are my preferences. You might be um, registered with um, an instructor that gives you a different list. And that's fine. That's You, you do what they say. But, um, you know, try... I, the one thing I would say is don't pick up a new type of paper every time you... You paint because you'll just have to relearn how to paint <laughs> every time learn one paper for a long time uh, get used to it uh, get used to that particular paper and, and learn all of its uh, um, characteristics okay so uh, that's kind of the nutshell version of um, materials and what I use and uh, what I'll do is when this broadcast ends as I will maybe put a list of the names of the brushes and things that I use and I'll put that in the description and uh, I'll edit that and, and change that up so that you can look that up.
anyway, um, I guess that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, that was fun just playing. You know, obviously I'm not framing any of this, and uh, that's that's fun. It's fun just to, you know, sit down and not without the idea of this being any anything in the end. Just practice. So um, yeah, can't can't be overstated how how good practice can be. Hi, Debbie. Uh, yeah, the ty the stylus thing that's that's all so awesome. Um, it, it it can be really good, and and you don't always have to use it with a ruler, by the way. Um, so for example, you're doing some power lines, and they scoop, right? So they might have a little dip to them, but I still would use the stylus because the stylus keeps the pressure even, and therefore my my line even. Let's get this actually touching. Right, so I could do power lines that are consistently thin, but they scoop. So you don't have to use a ruler, but um, but if you use that stylus, it keeps the pressure even. Uh, just don't press into your paper. Um, you don't want to make a dent in your paper. And uh, yeah, so that's going to wrap it up for today. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, by all means put them in the... Um, in the comments section of this video and I will answer them for you. You might think of something afterwards. So thanks everybody and uh, have a great week. Stay cool and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.